Do you find it hard to explain to friends and family what you now do? Are you wasting valuable time by attempting to figure out challenges on your own? We have created a community for ex-corporate people running their own business who want to live a life they love whilst giving back to their community. This is the Build Live Give Show. We bring you first-hand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day. We get real with no corporate BS. And now your host, Paul Higgins. Welcome to the Build Live Give podcast, episode number 20. And I'm Paul Higgins and I'm your show host. And today we've got Alicia Hancock from Hancock Creative. And Alicia started her journey as a journalist and she interviewed some of the biggest names in the world, including Adele, Matt Damon, just to name a few. And she loved the job, but she found the industry quite inflexible and it really wasn't doing what she wanted to do in her life. It wasn't providing the value that she wanted. So she thought there was a better way. And with the backing of her husband, she went out and created her own agency. And you'll hear in today's story just how much she impacts the world by helping those causes that make a difference in the world and how she helps them with marketing and social media. And she uh, is really brilliant at what she's doing and a true inspiration. And you'll get some great tips also on how to manage someone's busy life, which uh, Alicia does very well. So what's been happening in the community, it continues to grow. So thanks for all those people who've left five star reviews. And please, if you love this episode, and if you love others, please subscribe to the podcast. And you can also check out more about the community at buildlivegive.com and also in our free closed Facebook group called Build Live Give. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Alicia, who will talk about her fantastic journey. Why don't you just start with a bit of your backstory as what you did to get to where you are now? Fantastic. Thanks for that, Paul. So um, my background's really in journalism. I was a magazine editor for more than 15 years. So I've worked for kind of local national publications, but I sort of started out as a kid going do I want to be a teacher? Or do I want to be a writer? And they were the two things I always juggled. And crazy enough, that's kind of ended up being where I sit in both of those spaces these days. But I spent a long time, I went to university, studied journalism, and worked in local and national publications. So I've been published in, you know, Marie Claire, Cosmopolitan, The West Australian, Farrah Fielders, you know, Silver Chris, Singapore Airlines, in-flight magazine, and even online magazines in Los Angeles. So I've had some amazing opportunities being in a media career as well. So I've, you know, been a passenger in a Porsche that was raced around a track in Italy with a Gran Turismo driver to interviewing people like Matt sorry, Damon. Was that, a, was that a Porsche or a Ferrari? I just want to... Porsche. Yeah, a Porsche. Porsche. <laughs> in Italy. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, in, in Italy, um, in a Bano term, to, you know, interviewing people like Matt Damon. I've interviewed Adele, Sylvester Stallone, you know, across, you know, music, film, all that kind of space. I spent a lot of time in there. So basically, I um, worked in media for a long time, but then started my own business, Hancock Creative, back in 2010. So really kind of saw then a new opportunity to create a new type of more flexible workplace and use kind of my skills as a magazine editor to help other organizations actually grow and achieve their goals as well. So we very much started out as a creative agency, sort of winning a lot of awards for our work. But realized it didn't really align with my passion so we've made a lot of changes and now we work heavily in the education space working with kind of not profits excellent and uh, we're going to dig more into your work side and in particular what you do for some fantastic courses but uh, a little bit about you outside of work so what's something friends or family would know about you that uh, the blg listeners wouldn't <laughs> um Oh, look, there's plenty of, plenty of things I could share there, I'm sure. But one of the unusual ones a lot of people don't know about me is that I actually at one point represented uh, West Australia in freestyle martial arts tournaments. So I trained in both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and uh, Shotokan Karate. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, if you don't mind me asking, have you had to use those skills? I'm really lucky that I haven't in real life. So I think one of the big things with martial arts is that you learn it so you never have to use it. So you know how to avoid the situations. But I certainly have had friends that I trained with that have been in situations and have found that extremely useful. And one of the reasons I started it was because I was traveling a lot on my own for work and ending up in, you know, France at three in the morning and somewhere I had no idea or, you know, Melbourne in the middle of the night walking through with my suitcase. And I always felt very vulnerable. So I thought learning some self-defense was probably a good idea. And 
realized it was the best thing ever for stress. Yeah, so true. My, um, my brother was uh, very good at a particular martial art and there's six years difference and I'm the older one. And um, he did use his art in vain and that was against me all those, <laughs> all those years back. Admit, there was a few times when I started out that I might have sent my husband, you know, flipped him over my shoulder and a few things. But unfortunately, he got a bit sick of that and decided he was going to join up and start learning it as well. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my brother's ex-fiancee flipped him one night and she just done one lesson basically flipped him broke his ankle and it ended his olympic career so um oh no yeah so that wasn't the best anyway we'll uh move on from there and and sort of what was the key thing that um made you think actually i, I want to yeah I, I do want to create this hand hancock creative i want to mm. go out and actually build my own agency what was your sort of thinking at that time um, I guess one of the big challenges was where I was working at the time. Um, I was in a traditional kind of media environment and I found there was kind of two sides to it. So the first side was that the kind of workplace culture that you see in a lot of traditional media organisations isn't that great. And I actually had a few instances where, you know, I was sitting in meetings and I um, you know, was putting my hand out for projects and, uh, you know, being told that, you know, it wasn't uh, a female led project and things like that, which was really difficult. And also as a department manager, even getting um, swipe card records for my staff and being told to discipline people because they showed up 15 minutes late or knocked off early or something like that and asking them to justify it. Whereas I actually noticed at that time, there wasn't a strong correlation between performance and hours so some of the best performing staff that did the had the best output and the best work ethic were the ones that would start a bit later or leave a bit earlier and the ones who were there the longest were generally the ones who were actually getting the least amount done so i knew there was an opportunity to create first of all a workplace that um focused on the outcomes and the opportunities rather than focusing on just hours at a desk and there was a, a real opportunity there to create something that was a little bit different but also at that time there was just so many people calling me all the time going do you know someone who does this and do you know somebody specializes and we need help we don't know where to go for this creative kind of stuff and um, that was kind of originally the impetus for starting the business but a little bit of a funny story there as well you know my husband popping up in the story again is that I must have been, you know, talking about this so much for so long that he eventually got to the point one day he actually said to me, he was going, you've got two options. Either stop talking about this or just go out there and do it. And that was actually what pushed me into having an appointment with a business advisor and actually starting to um, seriously plan setting up a business. Excellent, excellent. And uh, I'm so glad he did. And <laughs> me what, too. What, what were some of the initial fears you had when you did take that brave move and uh, go out on your own? Oh God, how long have you got? <laughs> um, look, just being, just the, the, the highlights. Would be great. <laughs> look, being completely honest, um, the first one for me was always about letting down my family who'd always supported me and believed I could do anything. I had a very successful corporate career. I sort of really worked my way up in the industry, had some quite senior positions. Um, and I always had that kind of fear that I guess if this didn't work out, if it it, um, if I wasn't as successful as I has been in the past, that I would be letting people down. And I think particularly for, for female entrepreneurs, that's one I do hear quite a bit. And obviously there was always that niggling fear in the back of my mind is what if I, you know, aren't as good as I think I am? What if I, you know, mess it all up and we lose our house? And, but then we sort of did that, you know, if that's the worst that happens, you know, how bad is that really? Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's true. And, and look, I think many, people that I have on the show and interview, it's uh, very similar to those fears. And those fears um, take a long time to, you know, disappear. Um, and, you know, you talked about help, to, uh, business advisors. Mm -hmm. Just take us through what help you did get to help with some of those fears and other things that you were going through at the time. Yeah, honestly, looking back in the early days, I didn't get anywhere near enough help. Um, I didn't have the connections or the relationships. I didn't know anyone else in business. So I didn't have people that I could go to for advice. But um, here I went to the local SBDC. I don't know if you've got the equivalent in other states, but it's a small business development corporation yes. uh, funded by government. You know, they have coaches and advisors. And I just sat down with um, somebody there and went through my business plan. And 
um, that was definitely another big moment for me because I went through all my business plan and what I wanted to do. And she sort of sat there and said, you know, I've seen people come in here that have been in business for five years that don't have as concrete a direction and a plan as what you have. So there's nothing I can see here that you haven't thought of. So if you're going to do it, just do it. And that was definitely a big moment for me. Um, I also spent some time reaching out to the few people I did know who had started up their own business and sort of picked their brain about their experiences. Mainly through my magazine days, I knew a lot of people who ran their own PR firms or marketing agencies. So I spent a bit of time picking their brains and going, right, what do you wish you'd known when you were starting out? And what were the biggest challenges you came up against? And I guess tried to future-proof myself a little bit from making those same mistakes. And I thought I'd had myself pretty covered, but to be honest, I, I'd really barely scratched the surface. Yes, yes, it's... Um yeah it's true and 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 now sort of like what um are you involved in any communities or involved in any uh groups that help you today absolutely and um, one of the uh earliest i guess steps into this space was um back in i think 2014 now when i joined the entourage you probably familiar with so yes. that's a fantastic program around australia that educates and supports entrepreneurs so it's more the education base of the program so for me at that point i started looking and going right i'm having difficulty growing and scaling the business perhaps it's just my skills in the space aren't strong enough so i went out to seek more support. It was mainly initially in the sales area. Um, I went to a women's networking event and one of the speakers who'd created this incredible multi-million dollar business said that's where she went to learn a lot of her business skills. So I, I signed up there and spent a couple of years um, building my networks with other business owners around the country, which is been really valuable for me to now have people that I can pick up the phone and reach out and go, have you ever come across this? And how do you deal with this? There's some amazing Facebook groups out there with entrepreneurs that I've become a member of. So I've got quite a community to lean on, but certainly for me as well in the last year, I also met um, Richard Bell, who's now become the chair of our advisory board in our business. He was the uh, former general manager of the entourage and you know, having him join the team as somebody who'd been there before and grown a lot of businesses in a similar space has been invaluable for me to have someone to bounce ideas off and to challenge me and make sure I'm doing things for the right reason and certainly to show me the roadmap of where I need to go next to achieve the goals. Um, it's been one of, one of the most valuable things I've done in my business. So I highly recommend people go out and find somebody who we've been there, done that experience, who can actually show you the way to get past some of the hurdles and obstacles. And I wish I'd done it a lot sooner. Yeah, that look, that's great advice. And that's, you know, why we've, I've created this group, uh, Build, Live, Give, because the exact same thing, I left corporate. Mm. I had actually some good coaches, like you talked about, but it was all in isolation. I didn't actually have a community mm. that I could uh, share my experience with. So, um, yeah, look, I, I fully endorse your comments. So now we'll sort of move on to the build section. And if mm. you walk into a group, into a network, um, what do you tell people about what you do today? Well, it's actually taken a while to shift that mentally because when we first started out, we were more of an agency and we were very reactive as a business. Somebody would come to us and go, can you help us with this? We're like, sure, we can do that. And it's taken time to really get that confidence of knowing exactly what we are about, what we want to do. And we've had a massive shift in the last year, which has also seen the biggest um, growth period in the business as well. So normally what I would tell somebody if they asked what I do, I would tell them that I help worthy causes like not-for-profits and social enterprises grow the impact they have on the world. So um, that I, I find that really opens up a really interesting conversation because most people immediately reply with, well, how do you do that? Yes. Um, you know, and I can then start sort of explaining a little bit more about what we do and what our programs are. And most people out there know somebody or have worked with a not-for-profit at some time. So it's amazing that kind of connection that it creates. Excellent, excellent. And um, um, monetization. So how do you monetize... I know you've got, um, you know, a husband who supports you and mm. uh, a young five-year-old boy, but uh, how do you monetize what you do? Um, it's always the challenge, uh, particularly for anybody out there who's just starting a business. When you're first starting out, obviously revenue is the biggest challenge. And, you know, I know a lot of people will go through the same situation like me where I actually didn't draw a salary for a long time out of the business so I could grow it. But the reality is for us now, we essentially have three kind of main product streams that we run. So we have a, a program called Gain and Retain, which is a 12-month program where we help worthy causes, so like not-for-profits, grow their um, you know, fundraising, their awareness using digital marketing. And we teach them and educate them and mentor them for a whole 12 months through that program. Um, we have two models there. We have 
some fantastic corporate partners. So we work with Bangwes Foundation, who funds 10 grants to not-for-profits every year into that program. And then we have other not-for-profits and cause organisations who join and fund themselves through that kind of program as well. And we offer our own grants and things like that, um, a limited group of those as well. Cool. Uh, we also run dedicated workshops and seminars. So people often come to us and say, right, we need help developing a social media strategy or our storytelling strategy. And we'll spend a day in house with them, helping them develop and plot and plan that by using templates we've developed over working with, you know, over a hundred not-for-profits over the last few years. And we do a lot of seminars. So I've done everything from presenting for the director general of the department of transport and his executive team on the social media space and what it looks like and why it's important to running small sessions for local community groups who are just trying to help, um, you know, people in their in their local community industry. And the third is we're launching um, mid this year an online school where we can actually take all of that IP and all of that training and make it a bit accessible by, you know, cutting it down into some smaller courses that people can come and join online. Brilliant. Excellent. And roughly when, when do you think that'll launch? Um, at this stage, we're looking around June. Okay. Excellent. Um, look, uh, I'm certainly involved in a lot of not-for-profits and um, I definitely see the demand out there for it. So um, I'll be happy to share that product when it goes live. And around your ideal client, is there any particular um, sector of, of not-for-profit cause base that you focus on or is it um, more, more general? We, we, we kind of, uh, for a long time, were saying that we work with not-for-profits, but we really did change that branding to say, now we talk about the term worthy causes, because I find these days there are so many different models of organisations that are doing good things, and I don't like to exclude one or the other. So, for example, we're working with an amazing social enterprise at the moment called Love Thread, and their goal in life is to eliminate human trafficking of women. Um, it's a massive goal, and for us to say, because they don't have traditional not-for-profit status that their work isn't worthwhile would really mean that we can't have an impact in as big a space as we want to. So we work with anybody who has a worthy cause, anyone who's trying to change the world for the better and needs some help of learning how to build awareness or how to achieve their goals in a digital world. Um, that's the sort of people we want to work with. So we've worked with everyone from, you know, Australian Red Cross to Lifeline, to Food Bank, um, Bankwest Foundation, right through to small community groups from neighbourhood watch programs to city councils who just want to help us educate causes in their area about what they can do more online to achieve things for uh, small budgets, small resources, but actually want to have a massive impact. Um, anybody out there who's creating something powerful and is actually really trying to help people and make the world better, they're the kind of people we want to work with. Great. And if, if a, a chair or someone on a committee is listening to, to you now, what's one piece of advice you'd give them that is often um, you know, misunderstood within mm. that digital space, but something that is really powerful that could help them? We definitely find at the board and sort of chair level, we find these days there's still quite a lot of resistance to social media. Um, and it's, there's a great graph out there that shows how quickly, you know, the, the uptake in our society was of the telephone and then of the radio and then of the television. And, um, you know, each new type of media took time before people took it seriously and thought it was going to be a real thing thing social media in truth became so much more of a real thing so much faster than anything ever has before and we still find there are a lot of um boards and chairs of not-for-profits and organizations that are a little bit risk averse when it comes to social media they're more focused around what could go wrong than what the opportunities are for their organization for achieving massive benefits for telling their story effectively efficiently on a regular basis so people will know how they can volunteer they will know how they can donate they will know how they can help and increase the impact of the cause so the, the truth is with social media is that people are talking about you whether you're there or not so if you're any kind of organization with any kind of profile people will be discussing you on social media but if you choose not to be there you're just not taking part in the conversation so you have no control of that message Whereas social media allows us to become our own publication, our own media outlet, and actually choose what messages people see about us. And it's such a powerful opportunity. So anyone who's still feeling like, oh, I'm not sure if this social media thing's a real thing or it's just for the you know, kids, something kids play with. The truth is it's got massive power for cause organisations in having massive reach, massive impact. And unlike any other type of media before, 
it's cheaper and easier to do than anything else we've ever seen in the media landscape. And that's why as an organisation, we don't say we're a social media educator specifically because, you know, in a year's time, there's something different we might be teaching in two years and five years. Our purpose is to teach people what they can do right now to get their message out and achieve their results. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And uh, I read an article the other day where I think it was me and Mark even got a population of 6 million people and in a month they went from no mobile phones to 6 million people being connected you know so just think of that social change you know that's going to completely change that country and hopefully for the better uh, and certainly open it up but I think that's that's it and I I don't know the exact stats but isn't if Facebook was a a country to be like the second biggest population in the world it's actually the largest now it's actually the largest if if Facebook's membership was a country be the largest country in the world now so it's just the reach is just that massive so it's absolutely true and the thing is we're adopting new things faster than we ever have before in history so you know we see things like uh, Pokemon Go when that was released within I think it was like three days it actually had more daily users than Twitter that's how fast we're adopting new technology now Um, a lot of people don't realize how big the reach is of Snapchat and how many people are adopting that nationally where over 30 percent um, social media users are active on snapchat nationally here in wa it's 48 percent so it's a massive opportunity for organizations to be going out there and telling the message particularly if they want to reach a younger audience but too many people are just being too cautious and not wanting to dive in there um, and have a go and these these platforms are free for everyone to get in and access so it's such a shame because if these causes don't innovate and don't find new ways to reach people they face the issues of you know reduced fundraising from government um they often have aging volunteer bases aging donor bases and these things are dropping off and dropping off instead of tapping into this massive opportunity for everyone from mums like me to millennials so true and look you know i worked for one of the biggest brands in the world for a long long time and we used to constantly say the marketing message isn't for you you've got to actually remove yourself and put yourself in as the consumer and for a lot of the consumers back then it was sort of you know 15 or 18 year olds which no one sitting around the board table was a 15 or 18 year old we had you know maybe daughters or or sons but so I, i think and the key message here i think is yes um risk adverse but also you don't have to know it all just get a pe- people like alicia uh, lisa and others to actually help you and um i think you know what you're doing with the the three options that you've articulated yeah. it's it's a lot easier to do it i, I certainly w- wouldn't recommend going the long journey which is trying to work it all out yourself just tap into the resources that are staying abreast because it changes so quickly as you said you actually need to get someone like yourself in so um it's so true even for our team everybody has mandated hours to spend on self-education and research because it does change so fast um literally one of my team was saying the other day she was in the middle of a presentation and went to show something on the facebook ad platform and it literally changed from when she'd been doing something at nine o'clock that morning to 11 o'clock you know the same day because they'd implemented a new format or a new option so the reality is um working with another organization not only do you have a roadmap because for us working with causes we've worked with so many now we know what kind of challenges there are and what problems they're going to need to navigate and the plans they need to put in place but even just having someone who has the time to do that kind of research and be across what's new and what's changing so that they're ready to move with it or not if they're if it's not right for their organization sometimes we get people go the other way and they're too quick to jump on the bandwagon of every new thing and they don't always have the resources to maintain it and it's not even where their audience is so someone that can just help them do the critical thinking they need to do before they just sort of jump in feet first yeah look brilliant advice brilliant advice and and now to you and in, in, in your business you know it's rapidly expanding you're doing a great job what are some of the key challenges that you face at the moment with this uh, expanding business there are so many um so we're obviously a heavy growth stage business we're looking right now for the next couple of years to double in size every year for the next few years um certainly one of the biggest challenges I had when I first started out is that I obviously had great skills in my industry and I had a lot of knowledge about storytelling and content and all that stuff from being a journalist for so long. But 
it took me a while to realize that it didn't necessarily translate to building a great business. What it meant is I could be great as a consultant or have that kind of model, but it wasn't really sustainable in terms of growth. So for us, struggling to get that scalability and growth has always been a challenge. And we knew we needed to be a lot bigger than we were to have the impact we actually want to have on the world. You know, it, it's not enough for us to help two causes or 10 causes. We want to be out there helping as many people as we can. So what I really needed was a roadmap how to get there. So I got too bogged down in the day to day. And what I really needed was to find other people that have specifically done that journey themselves and go, right, what does it take as a growth stage businesses? What are the stages you have to move through? When should they happen um, to actually help me build that roadmap? And I've gone in the business from literally sometimes not knowing what I was going to do the next day to having a clear plan now of where we're going to, where the business is going to look like at the end of 2018, which is a really exciting place to be in. Yeah, fantastic. And, you know, if I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that your why was so strong, even when you went to that business advisor from the, from the government mm. at the start, your why was really clear. It's the how and the what that seems to be better crystallized with actually getting that help. I think so. And for me for so long as well, looking back, I can see with the you know, wisdom of hindsight that I was often hedging my bets with the business. So we'll do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And anytime someone came to us and went, can you do this? We're like, yes, sure, we'll find a way. So we were recreating the wheel for every single customer. Unfortunately, while that can be good in some ways, it's just not scalable. We weren't clear about who we were. And it's, imagine, it's amazing how much stronger we've become since we know um, how to say no. And when people come to us, we go, no, thank you. I don't it doesn't matter to us how much money you want to put towards your project. It's not for us. It's not aligned with where we're going and getting that clarity and getting rid of all the side things that we were working on and all the different things I've been involved with and all those, you know, extra things. We were just keeping that just in case and just went, this is just what we do. We have one audience. We have a couple of products. Um, it's been amazing how much our impact has been able to grow in a really short time just by owning that and going, we're prepared to put everything on the line to make this work. Yeah, brilliant. Fantastic. And I know with your husband, he was very supportive. Uh, and and your, earlier you said that he was the one that actually said, you know, sliding door here, which which one are you going to take? And I'm glad you took yeah. the one you did. <laughs> if, if he was listening to this podcast today, what would you say want to say to him about the support he's given you? I guess it's always been about believing me, believing in me because, um, you know, this business has been going for over six years now and there's been some really tough times in there. There's been times I've really doubted myself and, you know, there's been times where, you know, I've been trying to grow and that often meant not taking any money out of the business myself and that, that, that's a difficult thing to do. But when you believe in something, you do whatever you have to do to make it work. Yes. Um, so certainly for me, it would be just about having someone that all the way along kind of just quietly in the background, like, you know, keep going. I believe in what you're doing. I think it will all come together eventually. And when those pieces of the puzzle came together, sort of standing by me and going, right, I know you're taking big risks here. I know there's a lot of things you're doing that could go wrong, but I, I believe in the vision and I think you've got to do what you need to do to get there. So I'm very lucky that I've got someone that's always stood by me and never doubted that. And I know other entrepreneurs don't have that. So having someone always there that kind of goes, yep, I've got you back and has had to do what he has to do sometimes juggling a child and everything else to, to make sure um, this all happens. It's, it's pretty special. Yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. Now, so the next section is around the live and it's a little insight into how you live a typical week if there's such a thing. So if you just tell BLG listeners, what's a typical week look like for you? Um, it's a funny question for me, I guess, because I certainly have more of a typical week than I do a typical day because balancing between a, being a parent, a partner and a business owner means, you know, my schedule has to be set, you know, a month in advance with every element and piece of moving part booked into it. Otherwise I find time passes too fast and you just don't get things done. So I need to find balance in my life in terms of booking out time to go to the gym, booking in catch-ups with friends. Um, you know, so I always start my month planning around my son's schedule. So when I want to drop him off at school, pick up doctor's appointments, anything like that we need to do. Then I fit in key events, travel, um, exercise. And then I go, right, what time do I have left? And then I start booking in the critical projects for the business that I need to achieve in that month. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the urgent day to day and the critical that actually helps you grow and mapping that out really does help you get a better picture. So, um, you know, my days can really vary. So from some mornings where I'm at the office by 6am to 
today, you know, being a Wednesday, I was at the office by six, went to see my personal trainers in the unit next door, trained for an hour, came back to the office, had a shower, um, had a couple of hours of work. And then I've been in back to back, you know, team meetings, development meetings, planning meetings, client meetings, and um, now doing this. And I wouldn't be able to fit all that in if I didn't really schedule my time. So it's really important that I do split up my time so that I can focus on all the things that are important and find the best balance you can. It doesn't always work, but I do the best I can. Yeah, no, it's a brilliant approach. And uh, I know this is a, an area that in particular you're incredibly passionate about, but it's the give and mm. it's talking about a cause. And I know for you, it's not about a cause because uh, you help so many, but um, you know, I, I will ask you, and it may be a bit like picking, um, you, you know, your children, I have got one, but <laughs> the analogy, um, you know, is, is there something that's close to your heart? I know you help a lot of um commute um causes but is there one in particular that's close to your heart um as you say it's a little bit of an all of them because for me i am about helping everywhere because i think there are so many causes out there that need help that need support and are doing something amazing in the community i often find there's so many causes out there i didn't even know these issues existed and i love the fact that we get to have an impact in so so many areas i mean we often talk here about changing a million lives and that's because every organization we help goes on to impact so many people in different areas. But um, I'm, I'm passionate in so many areas personally, um, certainly in anything to do with cancer, cancer prevention and treatment, because we've had a lot of um, people in our lives touched by cancer. Children's causes, I'm really passionate about, and I'm something of a bit of an animal activist. So I certainly think in our program, we've got a bit of a balance of health causes, children's causes, um, animal related causes and a bunch of other things that I don't even know that are out there until I start working with them. So for us, it's all about let's change the world. And I think there's so many people out there having an impact in so many different ways that, you know, the chance to touch all of those causes instead of just having to pick one is one of the things I love the most about the work we're doing. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I'm sure uh, the, the passion that's coming through on this uh, podcast, the BLG lift listeners would uh, absolutely love and connect with. So the last section is around the action section. So just some practical advice that you can give the BLG listeners so they can uh, add a bit more time to their day to actually help some of the causes that uh, you certainly support. So the first is around your personal productivity tip. So what's one personal productivity tip you'd love to share with the listeners? The best thing for me is just the planning your week. So chunking up your calendar to make sure you find time for everything that matters for you. So it helps you avoid being ruled by your to-do list and means you can focus more on growth uh, and projects and less on those day-to-day tasks. Because sometimes, particularly when you're first starting out, you get this massive list of things you need to do and you just end up working through that. And then three months pass and you're like, I haven't hit any of those major goals. And it's because you haven't had time to plan. So I chunk up my calendar into times for working on our operational plan. I even plan out time for thinking. I plan out chunks of time for team time where I'm just going to spend some time with my guys and talk to them and see what's going on with them. Um, I'll chunk out time for, you know, marketing and promotions. And I think by doing that, it makes sure over the course of the month, you are doing all the things you need to do to actually achieve your goals. Fantastic. And just out of interest, have you ever done any Franklin Covey training? No. No, because... uh, what you said is uh, certainly right in the, the middle of uh, Franklin Covey and they sort of talk about seven key roles mm. in your life and how you balance those through your week. So, um, yeah, it sounds like something similar to some training I've done before. So I, I have to say I've seen probably four or five really amazing, inspiring entrepreneurs and people in business that have actually taught this methodology. And I, I kind of kept seeing it over and over and in the end went, there's got to be something to this. Everybody I see that's really successful seems to follow this kind of model. And you obviously have to adapt it to make it your own and work out what your priorities in your life. So for me, it's important for me that I'm able to do school drop off and pick up with my son on certain days and get quality time with him. But it's also important for me that I'm also still growing uh, impact with the business as well. So it's about finding the time to balance all of those the best you can. But the only way you can do that is planning. Otherwise, you always feel like there's not enough time in the day. Yeah, no, look, so true, so true. And the next is around some apps. So um, as you said, with social media, et cetera, that sort of typically is on a mobile phone and most people these days can't be uh, without their mobile phone. What are some of the key apps that you've got in your mobile phone that help you be more productive? Great question. Um, 
I have to admit, a bit of a weakness here. Google Maps is one of my favorite. I am very strong in a lot of areas, but I have a tendency to get lost very easily. <laughs> so I rely very heavily on my Google Maps to get me from point A to point B. Um, I, I love a good Uber, um, especially when I'm heading into the city. It's very handy because you know you can get someone there in five minutes, which is amazing. Um, I love my podcast, which is always on the home screen of my um, phone. And I always listen to podcasts in the car. So for me, that's almost my way of mentally changing gears in the morning from, you know, mum and wife and friend to now I'm in the business gear. I sort of sit and listen to those podcasts while I'm driving, which is a really great way to start my day and get me focused. Um, I love um, Podio we use for quick communication with my team. So I have alerts coming up on my phone with what's going on with my team when I'm not around in the office. Um, I like to use Trello for project planning and um, sort of big picture thinking and mapping out stuff. Um, and Kindle, always with me everywhere. I'm a big reader, so I always have something with me to read, whether it's on my phone or my iPad. Um, right. Always got a couple of business books on the go and a couple of you know fiction books as well for a bit of relaxation. Excellent. So what I'd love is, uh, you know, one podcast you love listening to and one book in those, uh, in your vast selection, the vast catalog. Cat 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 awesome. Um, like podcasts, I have to say my favorite for being for quite a while would be, um, online marketing made easy by Amy Porterfield. Yes. Um, personally, I would love to meet Amy one day. It's in my, it's in my list of personal goals. I think what she does is amazing. Um, as a female entrepreneur that's gone from, she was working, uh, once upon a time in marketing with Tony Robbins, went out on her own. So she went from that sort of corporate background, went out on her own, started her own business. And she talks very, very honestly and openly about every element of her business and her story and the mistakes she's made and her successes. And it's amazing to have someone so transparent, but her advice is just so practical and hands-on. So I always listen to her podcast every week. So I'm a big fan. And I think her stuff translates to so many different industries. Um, with books, it's very much like uh, asking me who my favorite <laughs> part is. Um, I'm a big reader. I probably read at least two books a week, and I have done since I was really small. So I'm always a voracious consumer of um, books of any kind. Um, in the business space, the one I've really enjoyed um, recently in the last few weeks is a new one out by Lorraine Murphy. It's called Remarkability. So I'm getting some people on my team to actually read it right now. It's a awesome book for people who are just starting out so she goes through her journey in starting her business and she run, she started australia's first social media influencer agency and she got to a million dollars turnover in her first 12 months and she talks very much about her own story and how she started her business but she has chapters on marketing chapters on productivity tips um chapters on you know, sales, every element of growing her business and just chunked it down to basically the best advice she's ever been given, the best book she's ever read and things she's learned. And it's a really great, easy read, but it's really condensed to some really valuable advice. So anyone first starting out, that's definitely a book I would recommend, particularly if it's somebody who doesn't like to read a lot of heavy business books. It's a nice, light, easy read. Fantastic. And I'm actually in a, uh, a marketing group at the moment who's uh, a lady in it, her business partner, or a close friend is Amy. So maybe I can uh, tee something up there. And I uh, would love that. that. I would be forever in your debt. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, the, the next question is around advice. So, you know, you've had a, a brilliant corporate career. You've, uh, you know, Adele, Matt Damon, you've met some you know, wonderfully famous mm -hmm. people and also some people that are making a really large impact on the world, which is great. You know, given all of that, plus your own personal experience, experiences what's a bit of advice you'd give to blg listeners on their path to to making a bigger impact on the world for sure um i think it's got to be simply playing it safe will never lead to growth or a world-changing business probably the biggest mistake i made in my journey that always hedged my bets and had so many you know fingers in all the different pies to try and find you know the balance to make sure we were safe and we were secure and stable but unfortunately what that meant is we weren't innovative we weren't growing we weren't really owning our space so i think my best advice to people is you need to go all in on your vision and if you want to create a growth business or a world changing business or something that's actually going to go out there and really make a difference, you have to believe in your vision, even if nobody else does. And even if everyone else out there tells you it's crazy, um, you need to 
own that if you want to see real change and see real results. I mean, for me, so many people, when we wanted to focus on the not-for-profit and cause space, said, why would you? That's an industry that has no money. That wasn't the motivator for me. It was I knew we have something really valuable to share and that's a sector that not only could massively benefit from the things we've learned from our media background, but also every time we help somebody in that space, we're having an impact in terms of changing people's lives and in some cases actually saving people's lives. We've worked with road safety campaigns that have actually reduced road deaths. We've worked with Lifeline and had massive reach there where they've actually been able to prevent people from committing suicide. If you can do that kind of stuff and have that kind of power in the world, you need to own that vision 100% and just make it everything you do. Brilliant, great advice. And uh, finally, how can people find out more about you? Sure. Um, obviously, being from a social media background, certainly on social media. So you can check out our website at hancockcreative.com.au. Uh, we have a Hancock Creative page on Facebook, on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at, at Alicia Hancock. Um, and, you know, I'm certainly all across the social media space. So I'm pretty easy to find. Excellent. Brilliant. Great. And just a quick shout out to Matt Hannum as well for introducing uh, you to uh, this great interview, this podcast. So uh, I'd like to quickly thank Matt, who's another BLG listener and uh, former guest. So um, Alicia, I've thoroughly enjoyed this uh, interview. Um, it's actually absolutely been brilliant. Your enthusiasm, what you've done is uh, second to none. So uh, really appreciate that. Uh, love you to be involved in the BLG community like you are. And we just wish you every success in the future. Thank you so much, Paul. And I really appreciate the chance to talk about what we do. At the end of the day for us, you know, I always have to remind myself that what I do a lot of the time and why I push myself so hard is not necessary for us. It's for the causes out there that desperately need this kind of help and this kind of support. So anyone out there that um, wants to help more in the not-for-profit space or has the opportunity to have an impact, we'd love to hear from you and we can help you connect with causes. We can help you provide training and support for organisations. So um, I'd love to be involved any way I can. Excellent. Brilliant. Have a great day. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for listening to the Build Live Give Show. If you found this show helpful, please share it with others so we can build businesses, live great lives and give back to the community. If you would like to join the BLG community, go to our website, www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.